Ontario's labor market increasingly depends on a highly skilled workforce, especially the so-called STEM fields, that is, science, technology, engineering, and math. But a new report says we're consistently missing opportunities to make the best use of one highly skilled segment of workers in particular, women. The author of that report is Beata Caranchi, Senior Vice President and Chief Economist at TD Bank. Her report is called Women in STEM, Bridging the Divide, and we're pleased to welcome her to the studio tonight. Welcome. Thank you. It's nice to meet you. You too. Um, you start your report with a story of Elizabeth McGill. Mm -hmm. Who is she? Well, I have to admit, I had not heard of her myself um, until I saw her featured on the shortlist for the Bank of Canada note. Um, they wanted to put a woman on the $10 bill. And so uh, I read her little bio, and that intrigued me to read an entire book on her. Uh, she was, uh, is, is, had become uh, Canada's first electrical engineer back in the 1920s, went on to uh, finish her education in the US, uh, to become an aeronautical engineer as well as an aircraft designer and subsequently came back to Canada and helped design uh, one of the most successful fighter planes for World War II. And I was intrigued by her because uh, back in the 20s, she would have been one of the few, if not only, women in her class. She was a pioneer. Yeah, she absolutely was. Um, there were other engineers, but there would have been like a chemical engineer, so she would have been the first electrical. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it, you know, the intellectual curiosity in me as an economist thought, well, how have women fared since that time? A lot of time has passed. Um, and how have we done as a country? Um, there appears to be a skills shortage in STEM, uh, in STEM fields across the country. Mm -hmm. um, if she was able to do that back then, why is there still a shortage? Well, she she was a, a you know pretty tough person. She also had uh, had polio, and so she was uh, not only one of the rare women in the field, but also she had a disability she was pushing through in her field. Uh, so just sheer determination on her part. Um, and then today what we're seeing is that women um, still are underrepresented. There are more women today, obviously, than men. There are look, you're looking at about 20% uh, representation of women with an undergraduate degree in engineering, about 25% in computer science. But that, those numbers have not moved much in the last you know, decade, essentially. Um, and so now this is the question of, you know, are there barriers to entry into this field for women, whether cultural, environmental, or if there are perceptions of jobs that are, these are jobs not uh, very attractive to women that are uh, causing women to self-select out. And so that's what we get into inside the report. You mentioned the numbers. Mm -hmm. um, so what do the numbers tell us about women pursuing careers in STEM fields? So there, is, there are not as many as you would expect. Uh, so what we do know is women represent the majority of graduates at the bachelor's and master's level in Canada, but yet they are definitely in the minority within the STEM field. So if you're only about 20 to 30% in the educational field, uh, you have attrition that happens between from when you graduate to those who just go into the workforce, some will drop out. So you have even lower representation happening. Not to interrupt you, but I found it really interesting that in the report you mentioned that we keep hearing that math is a barrier. Mm -hmm. But you actually said that in high school, uh, girls have better math scores, but boys who have less scores mm -hmm. in math, uh, lower grades, actually think they do well in math and pursue those careers anyway. Right. So, so what's interesting is a lot of people refer to um, what are called PISA scores, where they test math aptitude um, across international countries uh, for people who are about 15 years old. And if you uh, look at how... Uh, girls, young, young women score at 15 years old in the 95th percentile, because we know these STEM fields higher, require a high aptitude in math, mm -hmm. um, you see that women in Canada score higher than uh, men in the US. And I use the US as a reference because we often think of them as very progressive in these STEM fields. You have massive companies operating out of the US and Silicon Valley uh, as examples. Mm -hmm. um, but yet women in Canada score higher than uh, men and the share of women who are scoring at those 95 percentile at higher levels are also larger than in the US. So it does tell us that math aptitude is really not what, where it's at in terms of it's an important input to your mm -hmm. choice of, of, of educational field, 
but it's not necessarily the driver. And what some of the studies have been showing is that even when uh, men who score lower in math, they will still choose STEM at a higher ratio than women who score at the very top of their game. Okay, so why is that? Well, and now this becomes a question of self-perception. So mm -hmm. one of the studies I found really interesting was a longitudinal study, follows people from when they're 15 out to when they're 25 and looking at their choices. Um, and that study was pointing to, and others have supported the same uh, notion, that self-perception of women and their aptitude in math is lower than uh, boys and men. So even when they score high, mm -hmm. their perception is that, that is not, they're not as good at the field as, uh, as they think or as others may perceive them to be. And so now that I can't answer because this becomes a question of more how much of this is played off of uh, cultural and, and parental influences and, and factors throughout the educational system. What I was able to find is that within the university level, there are examples of universities who are moving the dial. Um, so one of the examples is Harvey Mudd, a school out of the US. And what are they doing? And they uh, significantly increased the share of graduates of computer science uh, who are women from about 10% to 40% in four years. And now that ratio is over 50%. And they did that by just making some changes inside the curriculum. So it's becoming increasingly clear that women will choose uh, STEM fields if you can make a stronger link between education and careers. Um, and so this gets back to the perception of what you think a, a STEM career is versus what it actually is. So Harvey Mudd went and took women to conferences that were led by women to show them how, you know, the application of computer science in every day. And they showed it, the application in different ways. So not always about gaming, for example, but about doing educational healthcare software development. And this was more appealing to people and attracting people into the field. And Stanford and other universities are starting to do the same thing. And all of them are seeing their ratios improve. Well, hopefully universities in Canada might adopt that. Um, let's go back to the report for a second. Mm -hmm. um, so your report says that even when women do find a STEM job, they tend to end up in the lower paying technical mm -hmm. jobs rather than professional roles. Why do you think that is? So and this might be um, a, a bias happening at the, the corporate side. So what we are finding is that the share of women with university degrees in STEM are, um, is higher in technical roles. So that would be someone who's, for example, a software tester. Mm -hmm as opposed to a professional role, who would be a, a software engineer, computer programmer. Mm -hmm. And it's important because if you are in a professional role, you're gonna earn between 30 and 37% more than if you're in a technical role. So even though STEM, relative to most other jobs in Canada, pays higher, mm -hmm. within, within the field, the technical pays less than the professional. And women are getting slotted disproportionately. Oh, so I was going to ask. Yeah. Um, so, what's the wage gap then between women and men in STEM jobs? Is so it there, improving? It, it is a narrowing, but there is a persistent wage gap that's that's happening there. Um, but. In every area, we looked at average hourly earnings, and in every area, uh, men were earning more than, than women, irrespective of whether it was computer science, uh, engineering science, technical professional. I joke that I'm making my children go into STEM fields, <laughs> um, but that given that STEM jobs pay better than most, why do you think more women aren't going into these fields just for that? Well, and I think this is because you need more than just the pay to incent uh, people to choose it as a career. You know, you're going to be doing this for the next 30, 40 years of your life. Um, and so I think this is where it gets really important in making the link between education and uh, careers that are relevant and of interest to women. And so one of the things I found interesting is I had found a, a Toronto District School Board survey where they were looking at um, teachers and, and their interest and ability to teach STEM into the classroom in the kindergarten through grade 12 uh, group. And they had a huge amount of interest, but 40% of those surveyed actually said that they don't know where to go to make that connection between education and careers. And so it's happening very early, and we know this is, an, this is important, especially for women, to make that connection. Mm -hmm. And it needs to happen very early in life. It's happening at the university level, but I think we need to take it back in much earlier um, channels of education. I just wanted to ask you about occupational sorting mm -hmm. and how does that apply to women in STEM? So occupational sorting, there's, you know, I define it in two different ways in the, in the, in the uh, paper. One is uh, you end up with a gender wage uh, gap because women are 
choose educational fields that end up uh, paying lower. So they go disproportionately into uh, education, government, health, and they pay lower than, for example, STEM. Mm -hmm. So that's one way it happens, by your educational choice. The other way it's happening within STEM is where I was saying that even when you graduate with these you know, engineering and computer science degrees, you're put in the lower paying um, occupation within STEM, so that's the technical. And so that's where I think corporations have a responsibility to really evaluate their policies and whether there is any higher hiring biases mm -hmm. um, and whether they're providing the same development opportunities that others are getting so that we are really leveraging the skill of our labor force. And why is it important for you? Uh, you represent TD Bank. Why is it important for you? It's important to me from, you know, as looking at it as an economist, um, we're always uh, asking the questions about uh, what's going to accelerate Canadian economic growth. And we're always looking to our U.S. Uh, competitor in terms of, of a labor pull uh, on Canada. Um, and it also has a number of IT companies that are competing. And we know we're moving into a very digital economy. And it's increasingly so as we go forward. So it's very important as an economist to make sure that we really are providing the same opportunities to all individuals in Canada. And we are fully leveraging the skills that we have here, our homegrown skills. Um, and we have so many measures happening in Canada. We have fantastic immigration policies that bring in skills. But we have to make sure we're, we're, we're doing both. We are not only making sure our population base is growing through immigration, but also that those working in Canada have the same opportunities. And we are fully uh, utilizing that into our labor force. One more question. Uh, this past summer, we all heard about the Google letter where an employee wrote a, an internal letter saying that the differences between men and women in tech had to do with biology. We also heard stories of women co-founders who had to create a male co-founder called yeah. Keith Mann to be taken seriously. Um, with all of these kind of, um, it seems like this kind of unrelentless uh, bias against women, what would you say to young women about why they should pursue careers in STEM? I think ignore that. I, I think you have to go for where your passion is. Uh, you have to be uh, determined and persist. Um, and I think we are increasingly moving towards, well, we don't have, um, women don't represent the majority of, of uh, people working in STEM. We are moving closer and closer to having critical mass. So when you get to about 30% representation, it helps for other women because they can see other people they can identify with. And importantly, it helps because more women start to land in leadership roles. And so I think uh, the, the notion that um, you, know, you have to pers persevere uh, and be a champion for one another is a really important message for people to take with them. Beata, it's been a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you so much for being here. My pleasure. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.